everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and I'm back with another Comic Book Wednesday. And this time we are looking at G.I. Joe number 8. Uh, and let's start by looking at the cover. On the cover, we have Stalker on the jump jetpack and Scarlet and Clutch on the vamp, and they are being attacked by something. It's really hard to tell what this machine thing is. Now, in the story, we do find out what it is, but as it appears on the cover, it just looks really weird. And I'm going to go ahead and say it. This cover is badly drawn. I do not like it. Looking at the splash page, the splash page seems to be a little bit more promising. We have a pretty cool drawing of a boat with a seaplane tied to the back of it. Uh, we see Cobra symbols, so we know that Cobra is back, and that's always a good thing. We have a title, codename Sea Strike, and we have a creative team of, uh oh, Herb Triumph Script and Art. We have no Larry Hama in this issue, and that will probably not turn out to be a good thing. Cobra Commander is observing the space shuttle from the boat, but the boat is spotted, so the boat dives underwater. So I guess it is also a submarine. Who knew? Elsewhere, we have the Joes training in an Arctic environment, which actually turns out to be an enclosure of some kind. I'm not sure if this is supposed to be in the pit or somewhere else. I do like these training scenes. Uh, it gives us a chance to see the Joes when they are not in combat, and it allows their personalities to come out a little bit. The training is interrupted when Hawk brings them a mission. They are going to the Kennedy Space Center to provide security for the space shuttle. The space shuttle is going to launch a satellite into orbit that will locate and destroy the Cobra Sea bases. Let's take a moment to look at whether or not this would even be legal. They're talking about putting weapons into orbit. There is a treaty that governs such actions, the so-called Outer Space Treaty of 1967, and it prohibits weapons of mass destruction in space but it really only addresses weapons of mass destruction. So if the satellite uses conventional weapons, it probably would not violate the treaty. The United States did sign and ratify this treaty, so this treaty is U.S. law. So if the Joes were putting weapons of mass destruction into orbit, they would be violating the treaty and American law. The comic book doesn't say specifically what type of weapon the satellite would have, so we don't exactly know if the Joes are doing doing something illegal here, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Somewhere under the sea is a giant Cobra Sea Base, and Cobra Commander's submarine is docking at the base. Now, is this Cobra Sea Base realistic? Probably not, but what the heck, I'll go with it and see where it leads. My suspension of disbelief has not been broken at this point. Cobra Commander has a meeting with his officers in which he announces that these sea bases will launch missiles, and the missiles will put satellites into orbit, and these satellites will have warheads that will threaten the Earth, and that will be the means by which they take over the world. The Baroness is there, and she mentions capitalist lackeys, so I guess... Cobra is communist? I thought Cobra were Nazis. What it boils down to is Cobra is anything that is anti-American. At the Kennedy Space Center, we are brought into the planning phase of the mission, and once again, I do like these planning scenes. It gives us another look at a different side of G.I. Joe, and it makes the stories seem a little bit more intelligent. The Joe's security plan involves setting up two rings around the space shuttle, two security perimeters that separate G.I. Joe squad will occupy to prevent any Cobra attacks. We have what might be a dialogue error. It says that Clutch and Ranger will be in the vamp, but Stalker is in the next panel and he's correctly named, so I can't really say exactly why that is. I will take this opportunity, though, to plug my position that Ranger would be a good alternate codename for Stalker, since the word Stalker now has such negative connotations. Flash and Breaker are assigned to be on the space shuttle, including during its orbital mission. That's right, Breaker and Flash are going to be on the space shuttle in space. Now, this is crazy. This is just a dumb idea. You need a lot of specialized training to go on space missions, and Breaker and Flash do not have that. The astronauts on the space shuttle do not need these soldiers up there puking while the astronauts are trying to do their jobs. The defensive perimeters are set up, and Breaker and Flash aboard the space shuttle, and Cobra attacks. Cobra attacks with these machines that they call sea legs, and they look ridiculous. 
You have to keep in mind that this is the pre-Destro era. Destro later was the Cobra weapon supplier, and at the time, Cobra did not have any toy vehicles uh, that they could use in the comic books. So what you got was a bunch of standard comic book technology. You wouldn't be surprised to see some of this stuff used by Doctor Doom. People often comment that the comic book only existed to sell toys, but I'm kind of glad that there were toys for the comic book to sell, because the toys provided better vehicles than this kind of made-up stuff in the comic books. The shuttle is going to launch in one hour, and the process cannot be sped up, so the Joes are just going to have to hold off Cobra until the shuttle launches. Grand Slam takes out one of the sea legs with the laser cannon, but then the laser cannon gets taken out. Stalker on the jetpack and Clutch and the Vamp decide to fall back and link up with the Mobat tank. In the meantime, Cobra Commander and the Baroness enter the fray in the Cobra Copter, which looks absolutely nothing like the toy that we eventually got. Again, 1983 cannot come soon enough. We need better vehicles for both the Joes and Cobra. The MMS makes a very brief appearance when it gets blown up. You know, the MMS was never used very well in the comic book. In fact, I think every time that it was used, Used, it ended up getting destroyed. So you can kind of guarantee that if you see the MMS in the comic book, it's going to get blown up. It's kind of weird. I wonder what they had against it. Let's go ahead and add that to the list of things that G.I. Joe hates. G.I. Joe hates the MMS. At this point, we have seen some G.I. Joe equipment get blown up, and this destruction of equipment allows the writer to add some tension into the story, where we know that the Joes cannot be killed, but the destruction of their equipment and weaponry at least gives the illusion that Cobra is making some headway. Rock and Roll shows up on the Ram motorcycle to take out one of the sea legs, even though I still think that that motorcycle should belong to Breaker. Rock and Roll does not need a motorcycle. He already has a great big machine gun. Breaker did not have any guns, so they should give him the motorcycle. Give the motorcycle to Breaker. Even though I understand that Breaker is on the space shuttle in this issue, but he still shouldn't be. There's no way that any G.I. Joe personnel should be on the space shuttle in space. I'm going to have a tough time getting past that one. The Cobra sea legs are destroyed, so Cobra's second wave is spearheaded by what they're calling amphibious assault guns, which are very silly looking tanks. You know what they look like? They look like those little ball syringes that you use to get snot out of babies' noses. They have fixed guns on the front end which cannot rotate, so these tanks can only fire in the direction that they're facing. That makes them inferior to essentially every conventional tank. Hawk orders the rest of the Joes from the inner perimeter to go assist the other Joes as they're repelling the Cobra assault. In the meantime, the Mobat's tank treads are taken out with a land torpedo. Alright, whatever. I'm just not even gonna comment on that one. Although the tank is immobilized by the land torpedo, it still has the use of its cannon, so it's taking out these amphibious tanks. Zap and Short Fuse also take out some tanks. Scarlet takes out one of them with a satchel charge, and Snake Eyes drops in and kills one of the tank drivers just as he's within range of the space shuttle. But this is all useless because Cobra Commander in the helicopter fires a missile at the space shuttle. It looks like the space shuttle is doomed, but Hawk is there and he takes out the missile by shooting it. That's right, he shoots it with a bullet. He shoots a missile that is heading directly at him with a rifle, and I am calling bullshit. There is no way. That is not possible. This has stepped over the line from improbable to impossible. The space shuttle launches, and Hawk avoids being cooked by diving into an emergency blast shelter, which is very convenient. And while we're talking about impossible things, the Cobra helicopter transforms into a submarine and then dives underwater so Cobra Commander and the Baroness can escape. The Joes are aboard an aquatic helicopter and they find the Cobra sea base which for now for some reason is floating on the surface of the water. They land on the top of the sea base and they suspect it's a trap and Hawk says that if it's a trap they've got to play it out. Uh, really? Is that actually what you do with the trap? I think what you do with the trap is not play it out. You don't go into it. This is the second issue in a row where the Joes have knowingly walked into traps. Suddenly, Cobra launches a missile with the intent of destroying the Joe satellite, and Cobra Commander announces this intention over the loudspeaker. He just apparently loves to hear himself talk, because he just tells the Joes whatever his plans are. Meanwhile, the space shuttle 
shuttle is placing the satellite in orbit and they get a message from Houston letting them know that the missile is headed for them. In fact, the missile is close enough that they can see it. Where are Breaker and Flash while this is happening? They are on a spacewalk. And that, okay, this, this is not possible. Not only do you need special training to go on a space shuttle mission, you need additional training to go on a spacewalk, and they don't have any of that. This is just ridiculous. Look, my suspension of disbelief has already been shattered, so we're just piling on the bullshit at this point. Flash has to come up with a plan to save the satellite and themselves, so he comes up alongside the missile and matches its speed. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. That is not possible. I looked it up, and the average speed of an ICBM is 7 kilometers per second. So that means in the time it took Flash to say this line, that missile would have traveled about 21 kilometers. Flash uses the jet on his backpack to change the direction of the missile, so the missile misses the satellite and the missile blows up, and whatever, I just don't even care at this point. On the sea base, the Joes are pinned down by Cobra, and Short Fuse takes out the tower in order to help break them out. The Joes rush Cobra, and the Cobra soldiers fold. Cobra Commander and the Baroness escape in the submarine before the Joes can capture them. Cobra Commander announces that the sea base will blow up in five minutes. Why? Why does he tell them this? There's no reason to tell them this. If he says nothing, then in five minutes the Joes get blown up. And even though he didn't succeed in knocking out the satellite, he would have succeeded in eliminating almost the entire G.I. Joe team. So that's got to be a win, right? And for that matter, why five minutes? Cobra Commander and the Baroness have already escaped, why not have the thing blow up immediately? The five minutes only exists to give the Joes a chance to escape, which of course they do. The Joes helicopter was destroyed, so the Joes have to escape on rafts. They give their Cobra prisoners a chance to escape as well, but the Cobras reject this. They say that they're going to stay and meet their fate. One of the Joes, and it's hard to tell which one because he's drawn so small, says that this is mindless obedience. And you know what? This is right. This is a little bit of an insight on the fanatical devotion of Cobra soldiers. But the peril has not ended. Since Cobra Commander has failed to blow up the Joes on the sea base, he is now trying to ram them with the submarine. Fortunately, Zap's bazooka still works, and he takes out the submarine, so it looks like Cobra Commander and the Baroness are killed. But no, Cobra Commander and the Baroness escape on the seaplane that was tied to the back of the submarine. Let's talk about the good and the bad, starting with the good. First of all, there was a lot of great action. I mean, this issue was almost wall-to-wall -wall action, and that's a good thing. Also, we get to see the entire G.I. Joe team, which we don't typically get to see. Usually, we see some detachment that is sent on a specific mission. We also get to see all of the vehicles and even some of the towed weapons, so it's kind of cool to see our G.I. Joe toys de depicted in a comic book. I also like the way this issue showed the fanatical devotion of the Cobra soldiers, and I actually think that enhances the realism. Human beings are capable of having that kind of, of fanatical devotion to an ideology or an ideological leader. Now let's talk about the bad, and there was a lot of bad. We have Hawk shooting a missile with a rifle, which is absolutely impossible. We have Flash and Breaker on a space mission. I just say no to that. No, absolutely impossible. We have Flash redirecting a missile in space, which again is impossible. Cobra Commander fails to kill the G.I. Joe team because he announces his plans to them again. We're starting to see a pattern with these issues. They often start out with a briefing scene where we find out what the mission is going to be, and after that we have a succession of perils, each one increasing in danger until the end of the story. Now that in itself is not a bad formula. It, it allows the tension to ratchet up as the story goes along. But the problem with the way that it's executed in these comic books is that each of these perils still have to make sense. If the G.I. Joe comic book had stuck with this formula, I don't think it would have lasted as long as it did. Later on, we get into story arcs and, you know, longer threads of stories that weave through the entire comic book series, and that really does help the series. But in the meantime, we've got to get through these early issues where they're still stuck on this formula, which, again, as I said, it's not a bad idea, but often is poorly executed. It destroys your, your uh, suspension of disbelief 
life, and it just leaves you shaking your head. That was my review of G.I. Joe number 8. I hope you liked it. If you did, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up. If you didn't, go ahead and give the video a thumbs down. But whatever you do, don't forget to subscribe. I've got a lot of great new G.I. Joe comic book and toy reviews coming up, and you do not want to miss them. Thanks, and I'll catch you all later.